But uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Mick West. I'll let him uh, rattle off his credentials, but I know him as a conspiracy theory researcher. You probably know him from the Metabunk website. I believe uh, Chemtrails is one of your first major uh, projects. Um, That's right. But uh, he's here today to talk to us about the mythical government UAP, that means UFOs, the You and Me report, uh, that uh, dropped back in June that a lot of uh, UFO fans, UFO followers were very excited for. And um, they seem to be still very excited, some of them at least. And uh, Mick is going to take a look at everything and see if that excitement is warranted. Um, so we're going to mute everybody while Mick is talking. He's got about an hour presentation. Uh, and then we'll see if we have questions. Um, I will say if you have a question, uh, kind of jot it down, hold it towards the end. And then... Um, Pop it in the chat when we're about to wrap up and put question in big uh, capital letters so we can see it. We'll see if we can get that asked to Mick. Um, I should say this is an official presentation of the New York City Skeptics, of which I am the president. Uh, someone was foolish enough to elect me. Um, and if you look in the chat right now, there's a, a link up at the top uh, for nycskeptics.org. I uh, just want to let you know that we are a a uh, nonprofit organization dedicated to science education and the promotion of critical thinking. Um, but that being said, things aren't free. Zoom is not free. Uh, hopefully one day we'll get to do in-person meetings again and venues in New York City are certainly not free. So if you like this kind of content, feel free to donate at that top link. Uh, me personally, uh, I do something called AIPT Science. It's part of a comic book website called AIPT. That's the second link there where we talk about science and skepticism in relation to pop culture, trying to break through our little bubble here. Uh, we just had a fun thing called uh, AIPT Sci-Fi Fest with some cool speakers a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're working on those videos now to get them up on our YouTube page. And uh, Mick, if you're up for it, this will go on YouTube at a later date as well. Sure, no problem. Uh, we have Drinking Skeptically uh, every third Wednesday of the month, which is which where where we just get together and BS about whatever, no topic really. Um, I believe that was in person uh, last month, but probably going back to virtual. So uh, follow us on Meetup and uh, you'll see when that is and you can join in. Follow us on Meetup and all the socials really, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you can search for us. But Meetup is where the most people seem to go. Um, and uh, we also have these meetings, Skeptics in the Diner, which I believe is every second Saturday hosted by Benny Pollock. Uh, usually discussion about a topic, uh, and when we can, we get a nice speaker like Mick. So uh, that's enough out of me. Mick, go ahead and do your thing, please. Thank you very much, Russ. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm just going to pop up my first slide right here. And it's right there. So, okay, so my name is Mick West. Uh, I am uh, a former video game programmer. And I retired from video games quite a while ago, and I kind of started getting into debunking and investigating strange things. I started out, as Russ said, looking into the chemtrails conspiracy theory, and I set up a, a site for that called Contrail Science. Then I set up another site called Metabunk, which is a forum for investigating all kinds of different things. And then uh, I've moved on to a variety of other things. I wrote a book called Escaping the Rabbit Hole, how to debunk conspiracy theories using facts, logic, and respect, which is all about how to talk to people who believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, I did a bit of debunking of election fraud, conspiracy theories, and most recently, I've been looking into UFOs, which is something I've been doing for, for a few years, but it's really kind of peaked in the uh, last year, uh, this year in particular, with the release of the, the UAP report, the government UAP report, which is what I'm going to talk about today, kind of uh, how it arrived, what's in it, and what the context is for the, the videos that seem to underlie it. So let's get started. Let me just click on the right thing here. Uh, so in June 25th of uh, 2021, this year, just a couple of months ago, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released the, the official government report on UFOs. And this was something that was greatly anticipated. And uh, the media was hyping this as being, the government is going to tell us everything they know about UFOs. But uh, it was generally rather disappointing. It was a bit low on details, but we'll get into more in that later. Let's talk about how 
the government actually came to do an official uh, report. Uh, the report is nine pages long, and it's it's really only about six pages. Uh, most of it kind of boils down to one page, uh, page three, which is the executive summary, which says, sorry, that's, I'm getting a little conflict here. Uh, we don't have enough data to draw firm conclusions. There's a few UAP, which is the official word for UFOs, that uh, show unusual characteristics. And uh, some of those could be sensor errors, and there's probably lots of different information, there's airborne clutter. So this, this was very disappointing to people. But you know what we're really interested in right now is, excuse me, let's skip past this. That slide actually wasn't meant to be there, but <laughs> it got left over from a previous presentation. What I'm interested in is how this report came about. And uh, the, re the report actually came about as uh, a request made in December 2021 as part of the coronavirus relief bill. Uh, there was no House or Senate discussion, and it mostly came about via one guy in government, which is uh, Marco Rubio. And he was kind of prompted to do that via another guy called Chris Mellon, which we'll get into in, in, in a second, and another guy called Tom DeLong. And it was the culmination of a four-year PR lo uh, lobbying campaign. And the driving force behind it really was these three UFO videos. Okay. So uh, let's let's look in a bit into the uh, historical context of these this report, how did it actually come about? What was the chain of events that led up to it? It really started back in December, 2017 with a story in the New York Times called Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program. Uh, this was a big deal because this was one of the first times in recent memory that the New York Times, a very august publication had presented a story on UFOs and presented a story about the government's interest in UFOs. There's been lots of speculation in other, other media outlets, but this is really the first time the New York Times uh, as, as kind of a, a publication of that weight as weighed, uh, weighed in on the matter. Uh, and so people got very excited about it. Now, at exactly the same time as the New York Times released their story, something else was happening, which was December 16, 2017, about the same time, to the Stars Academy uh, also, released one of these videos, which was at the same time. So what is uh, To The Stars Academy? To The Stars Academy is an organization formed by uh, Tom DeLong, along with uh, a variety of people who had sat there on the stage with him. There is Chris Mellon. There's Lou Elizondo, who's someone you've probably seen on TV. There is Steve Justice, who is a former engineer at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. He actually was the head of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. There's Hal Putoff, who is a, one of the old timers who, who Russ uh, probably mentioned earlier, who uh, has been into UFOs for a very, very long time. And Jim Semivan, I believe is the former CIA uh, operative who is now into this type of thing. These are all very interesting people. And I, you know, if you're interested in this topic, I kind of recommend looking into the history uh, of the organization and these people and how they got to be here. But the, the prime movers here are the, the first three, Tom DeLong, uh, Chris Mellon, and Lou Elizondo. And Tom DeLong, uh, if you're not familiar with him, is actually a rock star. He's literally a rock star. He was the... Uh, one of the co-founders of the, the rock group Blink-182. And you can see he, he still actually does that. He still actually does perform as a rock star. But he's also someone who's very big into UFOs, and he kind of leveraged, I believe, his, his fame and his money into forming this organization. Uh, another prime mover here, Lou Elizondo. You've probably seen him on TV. He used to work with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which is the people who produced this report. And he ostensibly worked for an organization called ATIP, A-A-T-I-P, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which was this uh, the, the, the secret organization that was revealed by the New York Times story. So it all kind of ties together. He also was the person who helped Chris Mellon get the three videos out of the Pentagon. So he's very much a key, key player here. Chris Mellon is a descendant of uh, the founder of the Mellon Bank. You know, think Carnegie Mellon, a very, very rich family. And he's a very rich individual himself. Doesn't need to work, but he works in, in public service. He was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence uh, during the Clinton and the W. Bush administrations. And he was minority staff director on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is another important uh, thing. So he's got connections. Chris Mellon is the person essentially who is responsible for getting the UAP report to happen. 
this guy here, Chris Mellon, is the person who is responsible. Now, all of these people, all of these people who are on the stage with um, Tom DeLong are what you might refer to as true believers. They are people who all essentially believe that UFOs represent something extraordinary. And most of them, if not all of them, essentially believe it's aliens. You know, some of them will couch it in different terms. They will say it is uh, ultra terrestrials, perhaps like you know, people from another dimension or something like that, or time travel or something. Essentially, they're talking about non-humans, non-regular humans. And they really essentially think that it's some kind of alien uh, people visiting. So these are all people who have got this, this very strong passion for the subject. And they really want to get the information out to the people that aliens exist and that UFOs are aliens. And so you've got this guy, Chris Mellon, who's got linked in with all these connections, who really is the person who got the UAP reports to happen. So uh, how did he actually do that? Well, it, carrying on with the timeline, like, in March of 2018, uh, about a year after the New York Times, there was another story coming out, which was the Washington Post released another UFO video. This is the third of the three videos. Also March the 9th, 2018, to the Stars Academy released it. So what was going on here was there was essentially a PR campaign. There was a, a linking of this releasing of stories to the media. The media writes a story about it and to the Stars Academy benefits from it. They coordinated with the New York Times at the start. They're coordinating here with, with other papers. Then in May 2019, uh, Chris Mellon proposed to uh, Marco Rubio, who was then head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, language to be introduced as legislation to create this report. And this essentially is what eventually got adopted via Chris Mellon, Marco Rubio. Another big thing that happened was April 27th, 2020. Now, this was a major media event, and I, didn't, I don't think it was actually intended to be a major media event. But what happened was on April the 27th, 2020, the Pentagon released the three videos. Now, the thing was, the three videos had already been out there before. Uh, the three videos were uh, FLIR 1, Gimbal, and GoFast. And they had actually been released you know, a couple of years ago by To The Stars Academy in the New York Times. And one of them, Flair One, had actually been leaked uh, before that. But the media like, took this to be the, like, the most amazing thing ever. Uh, there was a huge number of, uh, of media stories. And this, this was something that was actually kind of organic. They didn't, it was, wasn't something that was really promoted by the, uh, the New York Times, the To The Stars Academy. It's just something that happened. And if you look in the history of UFOlogy, this was the biggest single UFO story uh, for the last 15 years. And nothing, nothing even comes close. Even the, the UAP report doesn't actually come close to this. So there's a lot of speculation about it. But you know, how, uh, uh, what, what, what happened after that was in August the 14th, 2020, the UAP task force was nominally established. This is an organization that supposedly is within the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the Navy. And they are tasked with investigating UAP reports and collating information about UAP reports, you know, UFO reports, same thing. And this was big news as well. This was, this was kind of news to everybody. It's like the government's investigating UFOs. What's going on? And uh, next thing that happened, December 21, the Intelligence Authorization Act for 2021 passed. It actually kind of was written like six months earlier, but you know how bills work in, in the government. They go to one committee, then they go to Congress, and they go to the House, and then they get folded in. So what happened was it, it actually got folded into, rather bizarrely, the Coronavirus Relief Bill, and it became law as part of the Coronavirus Relief Bill. And what it says is that within 180 days of the enactment of the Act, the, uh, the, the Director of National Intelligence will have to submit a report to, to, to Congress, and it will be public, and that will basically tell us everything we, they know about UAPs. So that's how it started. And so this, we got this 180 day deadline started December 20 something of uh, last year. Six months after that, uh, well, what, what happened during that time, there was a lot of speculation. There was a huge amount of speculation about what this would be. The media thought that this was a directive for the government to release all of the secret information it had on UFOs, which is what people have been longing for for, for, for decades. So the government will tell us, you know, what's going on in Area 51? Where are the alien bodies? Was that autopsy real? You know, uh, all, uh, all these things that people wanted answers, uh, wanted 
wanted answers to, they thought might be in this report. And almost exactly 180 days later, in June 25th, 2021, it was actually released. But, you know, what was actually in this report? Excuse me. Again, it was six pages. It's, it's a very short report. People were very, very disappointed. They were expecting reams of paper listing all these cases, but there was essentially just six pages. There was a title page, there was six pages, and then there was like a, a little, little um, appendix which just lists the legislation. There's really only six pages. There's, there's no uh, case details in it. Uh, they don't talk about any of the cases except for like one in passing mention in, in detail. So they don't explain anything. Nothing actually gets explained, which is very, very disappointing to people. They mentioned 144 cases, and they said one of them was solved. Now, people make a big deal of this. They say, there's 144 cases, and they could only solve one of them. That means that you know, more than 99% of cases remain unsolved. But that's not true. What actually happened here is these 144 cases were the ones that were already unsolved, that have already been investigated. They're already people had locked into them and they decided that we couldn't figure out what this thing was. And so this is kind of the cream of the crop. People see things in the sky all the time. People see probably hundreds of thousands of UFOs every day. Most of them are birds and balloons and planes and things like that, and they just discard them. Some of them are a bit more interesting. They kind of make the cut. And some of them you, I, I, I investigate and figure out what they are, maybe. Uh, but some of them, yeah, you can't tell what they are. So we had 144 cases. They did a good job, and they actually managed to get one more of those cases solved. But the fact that there's 144 unsolved cases doesn't really tell you anything about percentages. That's just the ones that they couldn't solve. Uh, it doesn't mention aliens. Now, this was a big thing that the media kind of made a lot of um, a lot of fuss about at the time, that they didn't rule out aliens. You know, so like the, the government has done a report on UFOs and they were unable to rule out aliens. But again, this doesn't actually mean anything. If you have a white dot in the sky that's kind of moving around, how do you rule out the possibility that it's aliens? The only way you can rule it out is if you actually identify it. So if you have a white dot in the sky that is unidentified, you can't actually rule out the possibility that it might be an alien spaceship. So the fact that the report has 144 unidentified objects in, obviously they can't rule out aliens. It's, it's kind of you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have something unidentified, try to rule out aliens, you won't be able to because it's unidentified. So it was a silly thing that the media kind of layered on top of this report as if it meant something. It doesn't actually mean anything that they were unable to rule out aliens because it's literally impossible. Uh, they did mention that there were 18 incidents that had unusual UAP movement patterns, basically unusual UFO movement patterns. And this is another thing that people kind of latched onto. They had 144 cases, and some of them showed these unusual movement patterns. Uh, but what, you know, what does that actually mean? What, is the, what do they actually say in the report? A lot of people mentioned this, this thing, that there was 18 interesting things in, in the report. But what does the report actually say about that? Let's have a quick look at that. So we've got a handful of UAP appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Sounds amazing, right? UAP demonstrating advanced technology it must be aliens or some kind of amazing te uh, technological uh, thing. But uh, they also said that additional rigorous analysis analysis whoops, uh, are needed by multiple teams or groups to determine the nature and the validity of this data. So really they're saying they only seem to demonstrate it, but we don't really know what it means. You know, we got things like radar returns that appear to move very fast, or we have video of something that appears to be making some kind of zigzaggy motion, but they don't know what it is. They've not determined that this is an actual craft in the sky doing these things. What they've determined is that their, their data shows uh, that there is something in the sky. And they actually go into a lot more detail on this. And this is something else that gets, gets omitted by the media reports. And what's really in the report? The best place to look in the report is the executive summary. And the very start of the executive summary says, the limited amount of high quality reporting on unidentified aerial phenomena hampers our ability to draw firm conclusions about the nature or ident intent of UAP. So they're saying we don't have enough data. 
You know, we can't tell. We don't have high quality reporting. You know, we've got these eyewitness accounts. We've got people saying that they saw things that moved really fast, but we don't know if they actually did. We have radar data that shows things moving fast, but we don't know if it's some kind of you know, atmospheric inversion causing the radar to bounce off something or something like that. So they, they don't actually know. They do mention again in the executive report that in a limited number of incidents, uh, they exhibited unusual flight characteristics. But they say, something that people admit a lot, these observations could be the, res the result of sensor errors, spoofing, or observer misperceptions and require additional rigorous analysis. So again, they're saying they need more analysis, but here they're actually calling out the possible things that could have gone wrong. We could have sensor errors. We know that radar isn't 100% perfect. It doesn't show you exactly what's in the sky. You can get fooled by things uh, like inversions and clouds and even things like birds and uh, other objects in the sky. Spoofing could be some kind of enemy testing out radar spoofing technology and kind of beaming signals into the, the arena. Uh, observe a misperception. Obviously, this is a huge issue. Pilots are not immune to observe a misperception. When they see something, uh, over in the distance, and it's just a white light, they can have the same visual illusions that you and I can have. And pilots, uh, as we know from research, actually do a little bit worse than regular people when it comes to identifying and describing unknown things. Pilots are really, really good at spotting planes and things like that. They're really good at finding airports. They're really good at finding targets on the ground and dropping bombs at them. They're really good at avoiding missiles and things like that. They're not very good at describing things that are completely novel because their brains are very hardwired into describing things that they know and things that they expect. So they're not the ideal observers to look at UFOs. And the report goes on to say there are probably multiple types of UAP. Uh, requiring different explanations because there's a range of appearances and, and, and behaviors in this available reporting, this low quality available reporting. This again, something that's glossed over by the media. They, they treat it as if UFP, UAPs, UFOs are just one phenomena. They'd say, what is the explanation for UAPs? How do we explain this phenomena? There's lots of different things going on. And this again is something that the report talks about more. Uh, again, something that really is kind of glossed over because people like to focus on the sexy parts of the report and not the boring parts of it. So different explanations. Uh, they say there's basically five potential explanations. There's airborne clutter, natural atmospheric phenomena, US government or US industry development programs, foreign adversary systems, and a catch-all other burn. So what are all those things? Well, airborne clutter funnily enough, is objects including birds, balloons, uh, drones, and airborne debris like plastic bags. Now, I say funnily enough, enough because uh, I quite often will point to a UFO video and say, that looks like a balloon. And I'll say, that looks like a bird. Or, you know, it looks like a drone. It looks like a plastic bag, a plastic bag flopping in the wind. And the UFO believers will, will mock me. And they will say, Mickey, you call everything a balloon. You're always saying it's birds. And you know, wh why would the, the, the pilots mistake a plastic bag for a UFO? Well, here's the US government in their official report. Their number one explanation for these UFOs, the things that are out there, is basically exactly the same type of thing as I've been saying all along, things like birds and balloons. Now, I got so much stick for uh, suggesting that seagulls might be responsible for some things because seagulls are white dots in the sky. But the US government kind of backs me up. Now, we don't, we don't know how much uh, they attribute each category to the, to the UAPs, but this is the first thing that they list. So I kind of think this, this might be the thing they think most of them are. You know, not all of them, certainly, and maybe not even more than 50%, but uh, um, certainly the, the, most, the most frequent category. The next one is natural atmospheric phenomena. And if you're into UFOs, you'll be familiar with a whole bunch of times where atmospheric phenomena have been cited as explanations. You know, famous one is Venus. Pilots and people are often seeing Venus off in the distance, and it's, it's very bright, and they're not sure of the context. Or some other planet, like, like Mars or Jupiter, that happens to be very bright that type time of year. And they think it's a flying aircraft. I've made that mistake myself. I have looked at Venus, and I've been convinced it's an aircraft flying towards me. And I stared at it for a couple of minutes until I realized that it wasn't. So you know, people make these mistakes. Radar gets tricked by 
uh, things like ice crystals in the air. This isn't chunks of ice in the air. This is ice crystals like in clouds, in cirrus clouds. It can cause radar reflections. Atmospheric inversions, where the, you get these, these ducting effects and these reflecting effects, you end up getting reflections off the ground that look like they're coming off the sky. Uh, and so the, this number two explanation from the US government. Then uh, US government or industry development programs. Sounds boring, but it's actually very, very interesting. This is, this is really black programs. This is secret government technology, things like that they're testing out a new stealth aircraft, or perhaps they've invented some kind of uh, new drive. Perhaps they've invented a, an anti-gravity drive, and perhaps they were testing it in secret and someone happened to see it. Or uh, perhaps you know, uh, SpaceX was testing their anti-gravity drive in secret and, and no, one, uh, no one noticed uh, where it actually came from. But they say, we were unable to confirm that these systems accounted for any of the UAP reports we collected. Now, does this mean that it doesn't account for any of them? I don't think so. I think it just means that they couldn't tell. Now, why couldn't they tell? Could they couldn't they tell because uh, they don't have access to that information? Or could they not tell in the sense that they can't tell us? And perhaps they do actually know that there's certain things going on, but they're unable to confirm it to us. Like when they say, I can neither confirm nor deny. It doesn't mean that they've looked and they haven't found anything. Perhaps they've looked and they've been told they're not allowed to say anything about that. So, you know, that's the official story that they can't confirm. But we don't know. We don't know if any of these sightings are actually uh, secret government technology or secret U.S. Uh, um, uh, programs of any sort. Of course, it might not just be the, the US, it could be foreigners. It could be the a foreign adversary system. And this is something that's very real. This is a very real issue. We know that the Chinese, for example, have used drones to spy on uh, foreign military bases. Uh, we know that they fly drones near to, to ships. So someone is flying drones near to ships. These have been observed. People have spy drones. Uh, it's something that's obviously going to happen. That there will be people flying things like drones and perhaps something that's difficult to identify, some kind of novel stealth drone or perhaps even some kind of new technology, perhaps some drone balloon hybrid or something like that. So this is a real issue, uh, but they don't even say anything about this one. They don't say whether they were able to uh, confirm it or if they, if they thought it was uh, you know, a, uh, a possibility. They just, they just mention it. They don't even really get into it at all. Obviously, it would be a very significant issue if that's what a lot of these things actually were. Uh, and you know, they, they talk about well, the, the, they, don't, they don't have any data, basically. I guess I was a bit quick to say they didn't say anything about it. So they, they said they don't have any data and they're going to continue to, to monitor. So they don't know. They have no, they have no idea, or at least they say they have no idea. And then finally, this is the interesting thing, finally in these five categories, uh, the other category, they say that this is kind of a weird paragraph that they say they they remain unidentified due to limited data or challenges to collection processes and we may require additional scientific knowledge to successfully collect on analyze and characterize some of them what does that mean i mean what additional scientific knowledge do we need to collect this information are they just objects that are too far away do we just need more powerful telescopes yeah, maybe do we need uh, better cameras in the planes yeah that's that's quite possible uh, or what could we be analyzing now that we have that we need to uh, to look at? You know, we'll touch on this a little bit more later because there, there is actually a suggestion that they make. And they say the they intend to focus additional analysis. The, the UAP TF is the UAP task force, intends to focus additional analysis on the small number of cases where UAP appear to display unusual flight characteristics. Because, you know, most of them are boring. Most of them are balloons and plastic black bags and, uh, and, and birds and things. So they're, they're trying to figure out what these ones that appear to show interesting behavior actually are. What else is in the report? Uh, there's this there's a bunch of good stuff in there, actually. It's very short. It's just paragraphs. Uh, they talk about clusters of sightings and they talk about how that could be collection bias. And this is, this is you know, a great point and something that you know, no one really talks about. We see and we hear about uh, UFP, UFO reports that are near military bases or near Navy stations. And we see 
reports about them being nuclear near nuclear power stations and nuclear missile sites. Now, is this because they hang out in those sites or is it simply because the people around those sites are a lot more vigilant and are a lot more likely to point out things in the sky and take photos of them and you know use radar to track them? The security guard at Walmart is probably not going to be as um, aware of things flying around in the sky as a security guard outside a nuclear missile uh, site. So there's a distinct bias there. They want to work on standardizing reporting. They want to try to figure out how to get things into a format that they can analyze statistically in a better way. Because right now it's a lot of anecdotes and they, uh, they, they really want to kind of get it into a form that they can do scientific study on, basically. They want to remove the stigma. Now, this is something that's an interesting thing because when you talk about UFOs, there's obviously the associations with little green men, tinfoil hats, flying saucers, alien abductions, probes, and things like that. And yeah, a lot of that is kind of justified because there's a lot of silliness in the UFO community. There's a lot of stuff that's highly implausible that people talk about, like being abducted from their bedrooms and uh, taken up and impregnated and then returned without anybody noticing. There's, there's a lot of silly stuff and that, that has created a stigma. But if a Navy pilot is seeing something that is unidentified, he can't tell what it is, he or she can't tell what it is, we need to figure that out. That's something that needs to be figured out. And those pilots need to be not afraid of being mocked if they, they report what they saw. It doesn't mean that it is, uh, it doesn't mean that it's something that is, is silly. So you know, removing the stigma is a great thing that is mentioned in the UAP report. Uh, they talk about using AI to search large data sets. This is, this is a good thing. Like the, the FAA has tapes of all the radar from, you know, from years back, and it has tapes of the unfiltered radar data. They could do things like use AI to go through that and try to figure out if there's anything interesting going on. They would try to establish baselines uh, uh, for locations and say, you know, is, is the UFO sightings over Walmart any different from the UFO sightings over another thing if we use the exact same equipment to measure them? And then they can tell if there actually is the, these hotspots. And then they kind of finish off with a, a response for a, a request for more funding something you see a lot in government reports is like, we could do a better job if only we had more money. So uh, they want more money and it kind of looks like they're going to get it. There's actually a provision in the next year's uh, Senate intelligence, uh, I guess, acquisition where they are going to uh, basically do the same thing. This report is going to continue. They're going to release it every 90 days and they're going to, uh, they're going, it's going to continue. We don't know if it'll have the same effect. So, that's kind of the report. Now, what I'd like to do now is kind of quickly go over what I see as being the foundation for the report existing, which is the three uh, US Navy videos that were released. Now, I'll, I'll do kind of a quick version of, of the debunks of each of these three videos uh, because they're all fairly complicated. They're all fairly complicated and uh, the explanations are in fact necessarily complicated. So don't expect to follow everything that I'm going to say here. Just give you a flavor of what's going on with these three videos. Um, so you know these three videos, FLIR 1, Gimbal, and GoFast, these are the, the foundations of the videos, of, of the report. Uh, the first one, FLIR 1, was taken on the USS Nimitz, and it was filmed in 2004. Uh, nobody saw the object in this video at this time by eye. There was another object spotted that might have been the same object, probably wasn't. Uh, it shows an infrared glare and uh, an indistinct blob in TV mode. You don't really get very much in the, in the way of detail in this video. It's very, very blurry. And, and the important thing about this video, if you want to analyze it, is that there's lots of camera changes. You will see it switching from one mode to another uh, mode and switching from one zoom level to another, you see it just switched there. And you'll notice whenever it switches, the object moves over to the left. Uh, so there's all these camera changes. Every, every time the object itself moves on screen, there is a, there's a camera move. And this kind of like, um, the, this led to two interpretations. Uh, one is that there is incredible G-forces going on. This object is zooming off and then the camera is rushing to catch up with it and then it catches up with it and then at the end it doesn't actually catch up with it. The better explanation, the simpler explanation, is that whenever it's changing camera modes, it loses the lock briefly on, on the object and it, it, um, 
it doesn't actually fly away, it actually continues moving. And there's a bunch of things we can do analyzing this video. We, you know, a question we get asked a lot about UFOs is, are they small or are they far away? Sometimes you get things like flies that are in front of the camera. This is far away, but how far away? Uh, we can figure out that uh, half the field of view in this is, let's see, uh, yeah, well, we know that the object is like 14 of its own width across this, this field of view. So we can kind of work out from that its angular size. We can work out from the angular size via a bunch of high school math that it has a range of possibilities depending on how far away it is. And a quite likely one is that it's about 20 miles away and it's about the size of a fighter jet. It could be a bit further away and a bit, be a bit larger jet, but you know, it's a fairly likely thing. Uh, we can also tell kind of uh, a few other things about it. We know the camera's at 20,000 feet. We know it's looking up at five degrees. And we know from that what its altitude would be at certain distances. And we can do the math again, it's just high school math. And kind of again, we get about 20 miles. Uh, it's going to be at about 29,000 feet. So, you know, like a likely size for the thing is that it's a jet, it's a fighter jet. So if it's just a jet, how does it manage to fly off the side of the screen so incredibly fast? Well, it, it leaves the frame at uh, 0 0.75 uh, in 0 0.75 seconds. And if you work out the field of view of the camera that works out about 4.3 degrees per second, which coincidentally is exactly the same rate that the camera was panning to the left. The camera was actually tracking this object uh, at this exact same rate. And uh, we can work that out just from uh, looking at the numbers on screen. It's very, very straightforward, simple maths. And what happens at the end of this video essentially is that the camera was following a plane or some, some kind of object, probably a plane. It's about 20 to 40 miles away and it's in level flight, it's just flying away. Uh, but the camera is having to slowly track to the left to follow it. It's not moving very, very fast. It's moving about one degree every four seconds. So you know, it's very, very slow. It's not, not fast at all. And uh, rapid camera changes, the guy flipping through all these different camera modes causes it to lose lock a few times in the video. And each time it does this, it manages to regain it. But the last time it does not regain lock. So the camera, stops tracking the object. It just it just freezes and it's looking in one direction. And the plane itself just continues at exactly the same speed it was moving along before. So it's not doing anything amazing. It's not really moving at high speed. It's not um, uh, high G-forces. It is unidentified. It's not just not amazing. Okay, the second video is the go fast video. This looks like a fun little video because it shows this little white dot kind of zooming in uh, and you see, you see it here, zoom in, and the guy is trying to capture it with his, his, his camera. And you, you listen to the audio, he's very excited about finally capturing it. And when he does catch it, uh, it the camera tracks it automatically. And the tracking in these cameras is what's called passive tracking. It's just looking at the pixels, like it's feature tracking, like tracking someone's face or something like that. And so it looks like there's an object moving very, very fast. Uh, this, this, this was a much more recent video. It was filmed in, in 2015. It looks like it's going really fast. And it looks like it's low and close to the water. It looks like this is just skimming over the surface of the water, just very close to the waves, uh, which makes it, you know, if it is doing that, it will be moving very, very fast. And they describe this as being a uh, holy ass moving at two thirds the speed of sound, which will be accurate if it was actually down by the water. But you know, is it? Uh, again, we can do a whole bunch of math here. Uh, what's on the screen here? We've got uh, the speed down here. 254 knots calibrated airspeed, uh, which is a bit less than the actual speed. And we've got the altitude, 25,000 feet. We know we're looking down at 26 degrees and we know the object is 4.4 nautical miles away because we have a range. We have some kind of, uh, some kind of radar lock that's giving us a range or something. So we, we know all these things. We can do some super simple high school trigonometry. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have, have forgotten your high school trigonometry, so you could just ask a handy high schooler uh, to do it for you if you want to verify this. Uh, and from that, we can figure out how much below the camera, the plane, is this object. And it's just this simple, you know, we have 26 degrees, 4.4 nautical miles, 4.4 times the sine of 26 gives 1.2, 1.92 nautical miles. And it works out, it's actually halfway to the ocean. It's about in the middle. Now, you remember before you thought that it was down by the ocean, so it looked like it's going really fast. But if it's just halfway to the ocean, it doesn't actually need to be moving at all 
for it to have the illusion of moving really, really fast. Because you have the plane going past something and you have something halfway between you and the ocean, it's going to look like it's skimming over the surface of the ocean, even though it isn't because of the parallax effect. And once we realize this, we can do a little bit more math with the numbers that we have. We can see where the jet started down here. We can see where the jet ends up. And we know it moves a little bit to the right because it's banking uh, to the left because it's banking to the left. We know the range and the bearing of the object. So we can see where the object starts. We have to do the same for where it ends up. And we see it only moved from here, this blue point, to here, this other point, whereas the jet moved all this distance. So it's moving way slower than the jet. It actually turns out it's moving something more like you know, 40, 50 knots. Very slow for a, a flying object. You know, jets you normally go around 200. And entirely consistent with the difference in the wind speed at those altitudes. We can also do a little bit more math. We can figure out how big it is using the, the pixels on the screen and the angular size. So what type of flying object is moving about wind speed, is only a few feet wide, is roughly spherical, has no heat source. It shows up as being cold in the infrared. Shows up on radar. Uh, what could it be? I think the most likely is that it's a weather balloon because they're round, they're cold, they have a radar reflector and they drift along in the wind. And we, we have other videos showing balloons doing the same thing. This was shot from a helicopter. The balloon actually isn't moving. The balloon is just kind of floating in the air. It's maybe moving like four or five miles an hour, if that, because it's very low altitude. And yet it looks like it's hurtling along, hurtling along across the, these rooftops, but it's not. It's actually, again, halfway between the helicopter and the ground. The helicopter is doing all the movement. It's just an illusion. Uh, finally, I want to look at the, the gimbal video. Uh, I want to look at this one because it's uh, the one that everybody shows. <laughs> if, you, if you see people talking about UFOs and they, they're putting something up, they show this because it looks like a flying saucer. It was filmed the same day as that previous video, the GoFast, and by, by, the same, by the same plane. And it shows a, a saucer shape. So it's straight away. It's a video of a flying saucer, finally. Thank God we've got a video of a flying saucer. It looks like it's flying rapidly over the clouds. And it also looks like it slows down, it rotates on the end, and then it stops. There's this little rotation here. And this is the most challenging of the videos to explain. And, and I fully anticipate that if you've not looked at my explanations before, you will not follow what I'm going to tell you. But again, just to give you the flavor of it. Is it just a glare, like the Chilean case? Now, the Chilean case was this case where an Airbus A340, this big plane, uh, ended up looking like this big black blob. And it turned out the reason that it was was that we were looking at it in infrared. And it was the glare from the engines. You see here how small the engines actually are. This little orange uh, blob here is the heat source of the engine. But when it's very, very far away on an infrared camera, it glares up to be something very, very large like this, that if there was a jet that had an engine, this uh, you know, a fighter jet that had an engine there, it would actually cover the entire thing. So perhaps this is just the glare from the engines of a fighter jet or some other uh, uh, jet powered craft. Well, you know, it's complicated. There's a whole bunch of questions like, why is it shaped like that? The, 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 the glare in the other case was kind of amorphous, you know, blob shaped. Why can't you see the plane? Uh, why You could see little bits of the wings pop out from behind the other one. Why can't you see that here? Uh, why is it rotating? You know, what's going on there? It's a rotating flying saucer. You know, why does it slow down and stop? You know, why is there a cold aura around it? The black here in this video is hot. So if this black is hot, then why is there a white glow around it, which would indicate cold? And you know, am I just doing mental gymnastics? Is this something I get um, accused of? Is that I'm not doing Occam's razor? This is, you know, all these answers make it really, really complicated to come up with an explanation when we could just say it's an anti-gravity thing. It's an anti-gravity flying saucer, and that's the cold aura from the warping of space-time around it. Much simpler explanation. But, of course, you know, being good skeptics, you know that um, the simply sounding explanation isn't really always the simplest explanation. Um, first of all, let's take the, the last of those, Gimbal's cold aura. This is an infrared video. Yeah, there's cold around it. Well, it turns out all it is, it's just a normal thing that happens in infrared videos. It's not actually cold. Uh, it's actually just an, uh, uh, an artifact of the video processing. They put very high contrast on it, and then they add what's called an unsharp mask, which creates a uh, kind of a boundary between light and dark, which highlights things. So you get these white glows around things. Now, it's... 
it seems like a trivial thing, but this was something that was in the headline of the New York Times story. The headline was glowing auras and black money. The thing that started this whole thing started with, in part, a misunderstanding of this, a misunderstanding of why there are glows around infrared objects. And they've never really backed down from it. They keep, they keep promoting it as if this is some kind of space warp thing. It's just a standard infrared. Uh, it's just standard infrared artifact. It's an unsharp mask. You actually turn it on and off in the, in the cockpit. Uh, why does it slow down and stop? Well, it's just parallax again. It's uh, it's not moving over the clouds. It's the jet is moving and the object itself isn't where the clouds are. It's in a different position. So as the jet moves around, so it faces the object, uh, the start is moving past the object and then it's moving towards the object. So now it's not moving relative to the clouds, relatively straightforward. The shape of the glare, why does it have a funny shaped glare? Why don't we have something you know, like this? Well, the shape of a glare is defined by a number of factors. There's, there's diffraction and there's the effects of focus and then there's the effects of image sharpening. And you see here, I've got a saucer shaped glare and when I rotate the camera, the, the glare itself rotates. You see here, the, my, my dresser here is staying at the same, uh, the same angle, but the glare is rotating. If I smudge the lens on my phone, you can see the shape of the glare will change. So if there's different stuff on the front of the camera, it can change it to be a more saucer-shaped glare. So there's a lot of factors. We have a very round glare there. It's, uh, glare isn't always exactly the same shape for the same camera. It can depend on whether the, the plane has just flown through some a rain cloud or something and it streaked the, fr the front of the, the camera. So there's lots of things that could actually happen. Uh, is the camera rotating? Yeah, you know, I was rotating the camera there and that would explain what's going on there. Well, yeah, you can actually see if you look in the sky, you might not be able to see it here because of the low resolution of zoom. But if you look perhaps at one of the smaller images here, you might be able to see that there are bands of light and dark in the sky that rotate at the same time that the flying saucer is rotating. And uh, that's only going to happen if that's an in-camera artifact. So if that's an in-camera artifact that's tied to the rotation, and it's exactly the same as the flying saucer rotation, that really suggests that the flying saucer rotation is also an in-camera artifact. Another thing to notice is every time this rotation starts, there's a little jolt. The camera gets jostled as if someone's like, nudges the camera, everything just moves a little bit. The only time, the only reason that makes sense if, that, if that's the start of uh, a rotation of the entire camera, which would cause the whole camera to rotate. And this camera actually does need to do that rotation. The way it is mounted is that it's it's um it's a very heavy camera system and it's only got two axes. Um, there's an internal set of axes that's just fine tracking, complicated, you don't need to follow this. Then there's course tracking done with exterior gimbals. And those, those are very heavy. And when they start moving, they shake the camera. They can't traverse the forward direction whilst looking down because of the way they're mounted. So every time it goes past zero degrees, it has to do a big rotation. And this is something that we see. And I can demonstrate this with, um, with this stick attached to a similarly mounted camera. It goes from left to right, but when it gets to the middle, it can't continue tracking. It would just go up. So it needs to do quite a large rotation of the camera to actually continue tracking in that, in that direction. So yeah, have I solved these things? Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I've actually solved them. Uh, people say, like, Nick, if you're so clever, you've figured this stuff out, you know, how couldn't the Navy figure it out? Well, you know, maybe they did. Maybe they did figure it out and they just haven't told us about it. And maybe they figured out a bit of it. Maybe they figured out essentially what I have, but they haven't identified what the objects are, which is exactly the same thing as me. I've not identified these objects. I've identified some characteristics of them, uh, which means that they are still unidentified objects. They're just not amazing. They're not rotating flying saucers. They're not zipping off at high speed. They're not cold objects that are moving really, really fast. They're just unidentified, boring objects. So what's next coming up after the UAP report? Uh, I think it's uh, worthwhile to kind of have a, a little broad perspective here. Look at, uh, look at the public interest in UFOs over the last 15 years, since uh, 2004, so 17 years. It's actually gone down quite a bit. If you look at this, this area over here between 2004 and 2011, there was a lot more interest. And it kind of, this is gradual decline to about, I guess, like 2012 or so. And then it was kind of this, this slow, or 2016, just a slow, steady state until we get to this point here. 
And let's zoom in a little bit more in the last uh, one year. This spike here, which kind of got things started again, you see it's just no one talks about UFOs here. It's really, really boring. All of a sudden, oh my God, this is the New York Times story. This is the New York Times story in December, 2017. And there was a huge amount of interest. And then there was a few little things, nothing really happened. Then it got kind of boring for a while, a little bit of interest here. And then bam, this was the biggest UFO story of, of recent times, which is the official release of the three videos that I just described. The Navy saying, you know, these are official videos. The videos were really, really out. It was really a nun story, but the media took it and they ran with it. Then there's a bunch of other stuff. Then we get to here, right at the end. This here is the 60 Minutes report. Big media company, lots of uh, interest in this. And it wasn't as big, though, as the, this, this, this report. It wasn't as big as the original New York Times report. I think people were getting a little bit of UFO fatigue by this point. And then the UAP report itself comes out and you think hey, that would be huge. The, the official government report into uh, UFOs finally released. But that's, uh, that's this spike here. Yeah, just, just before the end here, there's a little spike comes after the 60 minutes thing. How they did anything is consistent with uh, the last year's reports. There's a little bit here with JJ Abrams has a new documentary out called UFO. But really things are starting to taper off. Don't know what the future will hold, but I kind of really anticipate it's going to go back to this kind of level. I don't think there's very much more going to happen, but we'll see. Perhaps the government will release more. Um, so is is this UFO flap over? Uh, the UOP report, bit of a bust, not really that interesting. Uh, the videos don't show anything really amazing. Uh, the government says we need more data, but that's exactly what everyone's been saying for the last 70 years. You know, we can never tell what UFOs are because they're a bit too far away or that we don't have good enough cameras or you know, eyewitness accounts aren't very good. Same thing. Uh, the media coverage is kind of dying away, but it's not going away because people believe, not just the general public, lots of people in the general public believe, these UFO enthusiasts believe, but we also have people like Tom DeLong and Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo, and people like Harry Reid, and perhaps even uh, Marco Rubio, people are in the position to get these type of reports done, who are pushing for it. People actually believe that UFOs are aliens are going to continue doing this type of PR, doing this type of uh, government disclosure. And some of it is a little bit warranted, I must say again, because you know if, if it's an unidentified object, we need to figure out what it is. But a lot of it is based on silliness, and some of it is based on things that really aren't as interesting as they seem. Uh, there are, so there are real issues, but ultimately nothing really happened uh, with this report. It um, was disappointing and I would actually have liked it if they'd, they'd done more, but uh, uh, it's, it is what it is. And we can only live in hope that uh, more interesting information will come out in the future. But right now, this is what we have. So uh, I'd like to thank you and I will open it up to discussion and questions. All right, Mick, thank you. I was, uh, I was originally thinking, um, well, <laughs> it's weird. It was like, you took up the whole hour, which is great, but like, Somehow you, I feel like you had to stretch because somehow there really wasn't a lot there, was there, which kind of surprises me. But we'll, we'll come back to that because I have a, a couple introductory questions. And if everybody, again, type the word question in the chat and type your question out and we'll make sure it gets uh, asked to Mick here. So I may have missed this early on and I could probably guess the answer myself anyway. The official change from UFO to UAP I'm guessing that was because of the baggage of the term UFO that you mentioned. Yeah, there's really uh, two or three reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that it, it kind of got adopted by the British, uh, I believe, back oh. perhaps 10, 15 years ago, and they started using it. And so it kind of caught on in a way. Uh, another is that UAP encompasses more things than simply unidentified flying it's objects. It's definitely a better term, yeah. Yeah, I, if, if you have a glowing light in the sky, it might not be something that's a flying object. It could be some kind of uh, something like ball lightning, which you wouldn't really describe as a flying object, or it could be a temperature inversion that caused a, a lighthouse over the horizon to appear up in the sky, or it could even be something like Venus or, 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 or a meteor like coming in, like you know, a fast-moving one, obviously. Uh, but you know, also, like you say, 
it does get away from the stigma because people think UFO and they think flying saucer and it become, becomes synonymous in popular culture. Uh, if you ask people, have you ever seen a UFO? They don't think, have I ever seen a little white dot in the distance? They think, have I seen a flying saucer? So yeah, there's, there, were, there were good reasons to change it, but I think ultimately uh, subjects take on the the veneer, the, uh, the, the, the what what's actually in them becomes the perception. So I think if people keep talking about UFOs uh, as UAPs, eventually UAP will become synonymous with flying saucer. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, speaking of that, so that last graph you showed about UFO interest, um, I guess that was by, I think it was by search term, Google search, I'm assuming. Yeah, that's right. It's Google, Google search term. So it's basically uh, how many times as a percentage of the total searches that Google gets, uh, have they searched for the term UFO? Now, was that just UFO or UAP too? Because I wonder if part of the decline in the interest might be that people are shifting to that other term. No, uh, it's, it's, it's just UFO. Yeah. Uh, but the UAP term really isn't very popular in the public. I don't people like still it. think I don't of like UFOs. It. I don't yeah. like it, but that's for <laughs> <It's>, nostalgia reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, that if you look, if you do, if you compare the two, uh, do a graph of the two different things, you will see UFOs is right at the top and you know, UAPs is this little bit of noise at the bottom, essentially, in terms of public interest. Now, of course, if you could just restrict that to the US Navy doing things, then it would probably be more like 50 50. But uh, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is where we are. Um, so now you asked, you preemptively asked a question that I was thinking of, like, um, Great work, by the way. I mean, this was really exhaustive. I think this is going to be a good resource for people. Um, but you. <laughs> you came up with some very simple explanations, I think, and convincing explanations to me, at least. Um, and you said, well, uh, people are going to ask, how did yeah. I get this out? But the Navy didn't. Um, well, we should say, uh, you know, what are your, uh, what is your background? Like, how did you get into this kind of stuff? Well, my background, as I said, is I'm a, a video game programmer, which you know, might not seem like uh, a useful skill set uh, for investigating UFOs, but it actually is, because a lot of what I do, uh, there's two, two factors there. One is 3D graphics, which is basically taking a 3D world and converting it into an image on screen. So I know all the 3D transforms that you take one thing and transform it onto another thing. Uh, it's you know, your projection matrix and everything, rotation matrices, uh, getting it to appear on screen. And you can take the exact same math and just kind of reverse it. Uh, you've got some unknowns, but if you've got an image on screen or a video, you can use the, the, the same mathematics to figure out what in 3D space would match this 2D image. And like earlier, I mentioned like, you, know, you couldn't. You could. You could tell different uh, things based on different distances. You've only got two D, but you can kind of figure out the third dimension if you do do the analysis right. And then the other thing from from game programming is debugging, which I think is kind of analogous to debunking or just simply investigating. When you when something goes wrong with your code, you can't just kind of come up with a plausible explanation and run with it. You have to actually find the real explanation and fix it. Because you know, it's, otherwise you don't get passed and you lose millions of dollars. <laughs> so uh, you have we have this huge imperative to be very accurate in figuring out why something happened. You know, if the say I'm doing a skateboarding game and the skater runs into a wall, most of the time he bounces off correctly, but sometimes he like shoots off into space. Yeah. You know, it happens one in a thousand times. Right. I've still got to figure out exactly why that happens and then fix it. So I got this kind of. Uh, dogged determination to get to the bottom of things on top of this this knowledge of 3D mathematics, which is very useful. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people who come into this maybe with a particular motivation, they want a certain thing to be true. They may not really understand how easily artifacts get introduced into camera technology. And, and yeah. Like that. And, um, and the idea of the simplest explanation uh, I, I liked how you said, like, some people will say, like, well, you know, stop with all this uh, special pleading. It's infrared, so it's bright there, but then the halo is diff as an artifact. And it's simpler just to call it anti gravity, an anti gravity machine. Well, first, it's, it's easier. First, you it's have easier. to invent anti gravity. So that's a little more difficult. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm sure people are familiar with the Occam's razor, but yeah. I, obviously uh, there's the popular misconception that the, the simplest sounding explanation is the best, <laughs> but it's actually the, the explanation that introduces the fewest new entities. And when you have to introduce an entire alien civilization, <laughs> that's really not meeting the standard of Occam's razor. Yeah, there's a few extra steps in there. Um, all right, so let's go to questions from the chat. Nirev says, do the reporters at New York Times, Washington Post, 60 Minutes, et cetera, reach out to you about your explanations? And if not, do you reach out to them? I, I reached out to them, one in particular, Leslie Keene, who's uh, responsible for a lot of this stuff. I, I kind of- um, She's a, she's a dyed in the wool UFO believer. She's not an impartial part. She is, yes. Yes, she she she, uh, she wrote a book called I think uh, UFOs, uh, Generals and Evidence or something like that uh, along those lines. But uh, uh, she she basically thinks that UFOs are aliens. I think she she believes that spiritualism is real and that she, she's been to seances and she thought that disembodied hands reach out and touch her. But she she says she's very scientific and she tries to be scientific. But uh, I think she has a bit of a bias. But I reached out to her after I, I, I solved the previous case, the Chilean case I briefly mentioned there, and she was initially kind of interested in talking to me, but then she kind of basically uh, didn't ever talk to me ever again. <laughs> and other people ask her about me, and she gets kind of irritated, and she says, Mick West shouldn't be so quick in debunking things, or he shouldn't oh. just debunk everything. I mean, why not? Why shouldn't I investigate everything? Why shouldn't, if, if things are wrong, I, sh I should go in there and figure them out. But I think... Uh, she she uh, she thinks I think I'm, I'm a little too quick, which is a, a criticism that uh, people level at me a lot of the time. They say that I declare things debunked uh, when when not when they're not. But yeah. you know, I try to present what I think is the best evidence, and I you know I leave open the fact that I haven't actually identified the things in these videos. Uh, but yeah, I the and the others they haven't talked to me. Ralph Blumenthal, uh, Helen Cooper. Uh, these other journalists, uh, they, they they don't really, they're not really that interested in the debunking side of things. But you've written for, I remember, I think it was when they announced that, I, I forget what exactly, it was before the report though, maybe yeah. the general public was seeing uh, those videos for the first time. You wrote for USA Today and I, you were on CNN, so how did those come about? No. Oh. They just, they approached me. I mean, basically I think uh, I've been putting up all these videos of explanations or investigations into these 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 navy videos and they uh, a lot of people have seen them and they share them a lot and some of them got very very popular and so when the media were looking for you know the other side to talk about it my, my name just cropped up because i've been doing these videos for a while and so they just approached me like cnn uh, approached me and uh, usa today and the guardian asked me to do op-eds and uh, so i did well that's good at least uh, yeah. it's getting out there. Uh, can yeah, it's a sm Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it's, a, it's, it's good that it's getting out there, but it's still a small fraction of the media coverage. If you look at the 60 Minutes story, they don't have any, uh, you know, none UFOs are alien voices. There. It was all people who were like, UFOs are amazing. Yeah, it's the biggest story ever, and they're probably aliens. But they didn't have anybody to actually explain what might be in the videos because that's boring. They didn't want to yeah. do it. And then T TMZ did a TV special, like a two-hour yeah. thing, and History Channel discovered that they they didn't really allow uh, the voice of science in there. Well, this is kind of a related question from Ken. Uh, what do you think is the motivation of the True Believer group? Uh, do you think this report proves their case? Well, probably not. <laughs> But why do they why do they want it to be true so badly, or do they think they're actually following good standards of evidence? Well, they want it to be true because they think it is true. Uh, they have become convinced that it is true. So it's not really a case of them wanting it to be true. It's that they believe it to be true. Well, how'd they get there? Yeah, the, I, I'm not sure exactly. And I think what happens a lot of the time with people who become UFO converts, and in some ways it is a bit like a cult, is that they get um, convinced by eyewitness accounts because people can be very compelling when they're relating a story about their UFO encounter. You, know, you listen to people like Commander David Fravor, the pilot who saw the tic-tac zipping around. He gives a good story. And what he describes is 
highly implausible to be an actual flying craft. And so because he's a very well, highly regarded guy, people become convinced by his story. And then there's other people who are convinced. I mean, you're probably familiar with uh, Jacques Vallée, who's a UFO researcher. He's a guy who interviews people and basically just believes whatever they tell him. And he believes that these things actually happened to them or that they were some kind of hologram projected from another dimension. But, uh, and then other researchers like um, John Mack, the researcher into UFO abductions, he interviewed lots of people who claimed to have been abducted by aliens. And essentially, he believed them. Um, Jay, was it Hynek? J. Allen Hynek? The UFO researcher started out being his, his uh, essentially an investigator slash debunker who would do reasonable explanations for things, eventually became convinced that there was something to it, but really because of eyewitness accounts. And so I think it's people who, are, who give undue weight to yeah. eyewitnesses who become the, the, the adherents to the UFO uh, mythology. Yeah. So maybe as a conjecture, people are swayed, swayed unduly by eyewitness reports, become convinced, and then it's kind of like a mission to show the world. Yeah, it. yeah. It's they they become part of the church essentially, and they yeah. they're promoting the message of the church. It's not that they want to believe the church; it's that they do believe it, and then that's what they do. They be, it becomes part of their personality, yeah, uh, and it, it does. Pr pr presents them with an obstacle in believing contrary evidence because they know it's to be true. So if they have disconfirming evidence, you know, you get the whole cognitive dissonance thing and then they, they avoid it. Josh asks, how do air aircraft cameras differentiate between medium distance, small objects and far distance large objects? Well, uh, that's a good question, uh, but essentially there's, if it's just the camera, they can only do it the same way that you, a regular camera can do it, which essentially is, is by focus. Uh, you can tell just by if something is in focus, you're roughly what distance it is. And of course, when something is very far away, that's not very accurate. But when it's within like a few hundred feet, you can actually get the distance from the focus. Uh, if, if you're talking about an aircraft camera, something like the, the ATFLIR system on the FA-18s, often that is tied into the radar system and they have uh, radar returns that are tracking the object at the same time as the, the lock on the object. Now, in these videos, it, that doesn't appear to be the case. In the FLIR 1 video, uh, there's no range data. You can see it, it pops up 99.9 .9 range, which means that it doesn't have range data. Uh, some people say that's because it's being jammed, but basically there was no, no range data. So you can't tell how far away it is. You just got this blurry blob, and it looks like it's out of focus, but also it's not getting any closer, which I guess is another way you can tell if you have an object that was you know, 10 feet in front of you and wasn't, wasn't moving and you just, you just zoom right by it. Um, so yeah, the, the, the videos that we have, mostly we're just seeing the, the image itself and you really can't tell from that how far away it is unless you make an assumption about how big it is. If you, have, if you know you're looking at, say, an FA-18, you know, its wingspan is whatever, like 30 feet, and you see how, how wide that is on screen, you know the field of view, you can work out how far away it is, simple trigonometry. But you need to have something other than just the image to work it out. Which is the classic UFO viewing picture problem, just kind of like... Um, mm -hmm. Small or far sense. away. Um, well, that kind of brings up the question in my mind. Um, well, first of all, do you think, I don't know if you have a sense of this, but do you, do you have an idea of what the general public's thoughts on all this is? Like, you know, we talked about the graph showing a decline in interest. Do you think the public cares about this, thinks it's aliens, thinks it's bullshit? Well, yeah, the, the general public is a very varied group of people. Yeah, and uh, a lot of them are very strange and have strange beliefs. Uh, a lot of people have very unusual religious beliefs that uh, verge on the supernatural. And some people actually have supernatural beliefs to do with um, uh, mystical beings and things like that. Not necessarily even religious, like spiritual type things. Some people believe in all kinds of magic things. 
So for a lot of people, it's not much of a stretch to mm. believe that aliens are real and they're visiting us. And so I think for some people, they simply accept it. So it's just, oh, yeah, there's UFOs and you know, they're probably aliens, but la di da, let's, let's go to the grocery store. <laughs> and you know, they, they, don't really, they don't really care that much. Yeah. Uh, they don't take they don't take people, the steps to to see what would be necessary to for that to be true. Yeah, and a lot of time it's because it's too complicated. They they see videos and they they say oh, the government's investigating UFOs. You know, the government thinks they might be aliens. You know, the government doesn't, but you know it's a story that they get and they they think oh well that's interesting. We'll see what see what happens and then you know what what else is on I TV. Wonder if, I want I asked that question because I wonder if part of it. You're, I think you're probably right, though, uh, that they just don't think about it that much. But a thought that occurred to me was that maybe it's more palatable to think that aliens are visiting us than we spend all this money on the military and on all this equipment and on training. And, yeah. and we don't know when and yet we don't know when something is close or far away or how fast it's moving. That's that's kind of a, it's kind of upsetting. So it, I wonder if some people fall in that category too. But that's such a weird perspective, really, for, for me to try to wrap my head around of that you would rather it be aliens than have an incompetent government. <laughs> uh, it's because, you know, if, I mean, sure, it would be interesting if it was aliens, but that would be massive. That would be the, <laughs> the biggest thing in human history versus a bit of government incompetence. You know, these things don't really balance each other out. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna actually gonna skip ahead a little bit and maybe come back to the other questions later because we got some good ones down here at the bottom. Uh, Renick, I think there's a lot to unpack in this question, so I'm interested to hear your answer. What would convince you in the existence of UAPs or UFOs? What standards would you set for definitive proof? Well, yeah, it's a slightly complicated question because you've got to define your terms there. What is a UAP? I mean, obviously UAPs exist. I see them all the time. I look out my window, I see a little white dot. It's a UAP because it's something flying and I can't tell what it is. So what you're really asking is uh, what would convince me that there is something that demonstrates extraordinarily extraordinary technology out there and, and possibly that demonstrates the existence of, of non-human intelligence behind the, these, these amazing craft that are flying around. And it's not really that complicated. Uh, I, one thing that... Yeah, it's basically better data, but better data could be a number of things. One of one thing that I think would be really useful to demonstrate that UAPs are a real phenomena is some kind of uh, confirmed triangulation of the motion of an object, like the same object viewed from two different cameras sharing the same motion uh, from two angles, so we can figure out what its path actually is in three D space. We can figure out how big it is. We can figure out how fast it is going. And does that actually show anything that's not uh, human or something that's novel and unusual? And then another thing would be just better photographs. I mean, why can't we get a good photograph of a UFO? Everyone's got cell phones. I mean, cell phones aren't great, but people are often saying they see them up close. If they're seeing them up close, they should be able to get an up close photograph at least once. I mean, it's been decades. Yeah. Uh, the last 10 years, people have had very good cell phones. This cell phone is, you know, it's probably about 10 years old now, maybe not like, you know, several, several years old. And it takes very good 1080p video. It takes very good photographs. And if there was a UFO hovering over a tree nearby, it would be able to take a photograph of it. UFOs always stay a little bit too far away to be photographed, no matter which camera you have. You know, I've got very large cameras on the shelf behind me. And, uh, whenever the, the UFOs appear, they're just too far away yeah. to be photographed. So a close-up uh, photograph would be go a long right. way to convincing me. Um, I wrote before, you know, a couple of years ago before, uh, well, I think it was after the Navy videos leaked, but before they started talking about the report and everything, I wrote something for Skeptical Inquirer called The End of Ufology. Uh, mm. Mark. <laughs> um, because like I said, I was kind of dipping back in and looking around and being like, what the hell is going on here? And I talked to uh, Chris Rakowski, who does some uh, UFO stuff in Canada, and he um, he's he's like part of the big reporting database up there. And he said yeah. that um, because I had the same question, why where are all the good videos now that everybody has a camera? Look at all the surveillance around us now. And he said, fully about a quarter to a third of UFO reports do have some kind of photographic evidence now. It, you know, in the reports that he's received, but yes. the point sources. 
it's like the saucers are gone the big black triangles are gone it's just little bitty points of light and it's like Mm -hmm. kind of damning in its own way or they are uh, tic tacs which uh, are very popular now that uh, because when you take a cell phone video of a plane uh, it often ends up looking like an elongated tic tac shape because planes are generally whitish uh, they're lit by the sun, but the bottom of the wings is not lit by the sun because the sun is above them. And so that blends in with the sky. So you just see the fuselage and you're taking your cell phone video and it's, the planes are usually very far away, at least like you know, five, six miles, you know, the closest, but usually quite a bit more, like 10, 20 miles. Uh, it ends up looking like this, this shape. And you see all these UFO reports. You look in these UFO reporting databases, you know, tic-tac shape moves behind trees and it's, almost always consistent with the plane yeah marcus has a good comment here just like the progression of ghost photos to orbs yes <laughs> yes uh, ghost photos used to be uh, like apparitions and things yeah. like that but uh yeah then digital cameras and came along and uh, orbs were invented now of course they're moving back to apparitions as we get better uh, apps that are able to to fake ghost <laughs> photos uh, Nira, I'm going to come back to your questions, just trying to give everybody a chance here. Uh, Joel, what's the best, quote unquote, evidence for UFOs, which is also kind of a tough question, but. Yeah, well, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to answer a slightly different question there, because I don't think there is any really good evidence for UFOs, but there are cases that are difficult to explain, and uh, there there aren't, in my mind, very compelling you know, photos and videos and radar data, things like that is all very ambiguous, extraordinarily blurry. Uh, and you know, the, often the better the video is supposedly is, the blurrier it is because you know, it's hard, even harder to see what amazing thing is behind it. Uh, but some of the eyewitness accounts are very difficult to explain, like Commander Fravor's encounter with the Tic Tac. Uh, I don't know what that is. I don't know what happens to him. And I'm very curious as to what that is. I wouldn't say it's good evidence for UFOs, though. Uh, I'd say it's a, it's a mystery that needs to be solved. See, evidence for UFOs would either be um, a really good case that was unambiguous, shows something moving really fast in the sky, or showed a close-up of you know, aliens getting on a ship, or we, we see something coming from the moon to Earth. Uh, that would be the best, really, you know, something actually moving, coming in from outer space. Proof that there were aliens, pretty much. Uh, or it would be some kind of statistical analysis that shows that there is a genuine anomaly. And that's a difficult thing to do because of the poor quality data sets that we have. And you know, something that the UAP task force talked about, that they, they want to try to standardize reporting and analyze large data sets and establish baselines. And we don't have that. We don't have this, this analysis of large data sets because the data sets are crap. You know, it's, it's eyewitness accounts of random people sending things into to move on. Uh, yeah. And we don't have these baselines. We don't know if the, we should be getting a certain amount of you know, sightings of birds in one location versus another. Right. So better statistics, uh, better data is needed. Yeah, I remember when I was, uh, when I was a teenager and I was a believer in all of this stuff. Um, they, this might not even be an accurate statistic, but a lot of the books I read would say like, well, sure, a blue book or, you know, people can explain uh, 95% of all the UFO reports, but it's those 5% that they can't explain. Yeah. Really interesting. And it's like, man, 95 now after going through a science program and getting a science degree and, you know, growing up a little bit and feeling a little more, more, more mature, 95% is pretty goddamn good. That's amazing in and of itself. <laughs> well, but also the other side of that 5% uh, of, 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 unidentified that's a lot of cases yeah that's, that's probably ten thousand cases at this point because there's been so many ufo cases reported do but we at the really same have time 10, you can 000? never have all the data really interesting you... yeah they're, they're not really interesting you know, there's, there's there's two things there's unidentified and there's really interesting you know, sure <laughs> you can identify or give a plausible explanation for 95 percent, but most of that five percent that remains are very low quality data it's something like a blurry photograph. Yeah, I can't explain it. You know, I can't give a good explanation for you know why this this light was in this sky at this time, uh, because we don't have the information. Maybe it was Venus, but we don't know because we don't know what time the photo was taken. You know, the guy says he saw a giant triangle fly over his head. You know, I can't explain that, but you know, did he see a giant triangle fly over his head? 
So it's not like we've got thousands of really interesting cases. There's hardly any cases that are really interesting. <laughs> and uh, related to that, Nirev asks, um, you mentioned the statistical point about the 144 reports being the cream of the crop. Do you have an estimate of the total number of reports of the 144? that the 144 came from so that you can calculate an explained ratio. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't, don't because we don't about. really know what, what the data set is. They are looking yeah. at, they said like things from 2004 to the present day. Uh, they started 2004 because that's the data that the Nimitz Tic Tac encounter. But they said most of the encounters were actually in the last two years when they uh, changed the reporting procedure. Excuse me. So these are things that, uh, they're not really UFO reports. These are things that Navy pilots reported on training ranges. They were out practicing their flying around, uh, practicing their maneuvers and the, the various things they have to do. And they saw something and they couldn't tell what it was because it was too small or it was too far away. Or something showed up on the radar, perhaps, or they saw something on a camera. But in all the cases, they're, they're, they're too small or far away. You know, if if they could identify the objects, they wouldn't report it as a UFO. So the pilots themselves are the first filter. And we don't know how many of those cases uh, actually there were. But then there's, there's a very limiting factor here in that if a pilot sees something in the sky that's unidentified, it's just, whoosh, it's gone. Because he's just, he's just flying along. If it's a balloon, he's not going to see it again. He's not going to be able to investigate it. So it's, it's kind of a different data set to the normal set of, you know, people seeing lights in the sky. So I, I don't think you can really kind of compare it against, say, like MUFON has like 130,000 cases in it. Uh, it's not really that type of thing where you can slice them into little tranches of, of interestingness. It's a very specific thing. It's, it's unidentified objects that pilots saw on training ranges, which, uh, as the report says, are probably all stuff like, well, not all, but the thing probably largely stuff like balloons and birds and plastic bags and atmospheric phenomena. I feel like a lot of, you know, since this has been a topic of conversation, I feel like a lot of people might think or maybe assume that military reports of UFOs are increasing. Do you think that, do you know, do you have anything to say about that? Do you, or is that just too arcane? I, I, I don't really have uh, first ca- first-hand knowledge of that. You know, obviously, we're hearing more about it yeah. now, but this is because the story has been, been pushed out there. We don't know how often did a military pilot see airborne clutter, which is how they describe these, these birds and balloons and things, in their training ranges in, say, you know, 1990 to 2000. You, we don't have access to those statistics. And we don't know what effect different technology has had. Like some of the pilots have said they started seeing these things when they upgraded their radar. So they get a new radar, it's uh-huh. more sensitive. And so they start seeing these little pings in various places and then they fly over and investigate them and a little balloon zips by and they're like, whoa, UFO. Uh, so it could be you know, related to that. Uh, we don't really know, though, because a lot of this stuff is, is classified information. I'm just trying to think now of all the, the people, you know, the people who aren't like us, who are kind of already interested in this, and the people who aren't hardcore believers, but like just the average person, like people I talk to, like don't necessarily know I'm into this stuff, but I'll overhear them talking. Uh, I think another thing that people will say is, um, well, the, the government's investigating it, so it must be yeah. But I think that goes to the point that you said earlier about somebody just slipped it into the coronavirus bill. That's why this is happening. <laughs> yeah, it, people talk about the government investigates or the Pentagon investigates as if the government's dropped everything <laughs> and has started to uh, like try to figure out whether aliens are visiting us or not. Uh, or you know, the Pentagon has, you know, with its uh, $800 billion budget, is devoting its resources to figuring out the UFO problem. But it's not. It's the, the ATIP program was over five years. It was a $22 million program, and most of it was probably squandered away doing like a bunch of nonsense. Uh, there's a UAP task force, which essentially is unfunded. It's just you know, two people, I believe, who are assigned to collate these reports. 
uh, the, 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 the report itself you know, wasn't funded. It's just people doing their job because it was the requested by the government that they, they make a list of things and they, they, they do some analysis. And yeah, you know, some of the stuff in the report, it's just, yeah, it's just blue sky speculating. Maybe we could do some baseline analysis. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Let's put that in the report. It's, yeah, it's not it's- the result of the Pentagon bringing its full force to bear on this problem. It's two guys in an office writing a report yeah. and phoning up a bunch of people and asking them, do you have UAP reports? Send them over. We'll, we'll look into them. Yeah. And if you've ever worked in an office, which is, is a new experience for me, I only started working in an office a couple of years ago now. Um, <laughs> so I, I have a little more of a perspective on it maybe, but it, yeah, it really seems like you said it was like, what, six pages and it was late too, wasn't it? Essentially, no, it wasn't late. Uh, it, okay, no, uh, it, but it's like it, it, it was, seems like it was released. Official okay. release. It kind of seems like it was almost perfunctory. Like, well, all right, we got to get this done by five o'clock. Let's just get it out. It, it was definitely short and disappointing. Now, the report was in two forms. There's a, an unclassified version, which is the one we saw, and a classified version, Ooh, okay. uh, which has a classified data annex which has a bunch of uh, supposedly videos and possibly radar tracks that that, uh, show more. more. But the the ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, has said that the conclusion of the classified report is exactly the same as the conclusion of the unclassified report. So all you've got in the classified report really is the, the data for these things that show unusual movement. So they'll say, here's a radar track. It shows unusual movements. But we know these things exist because they talk about them in the classified, the unclassified report. We just don't know exactly what they were and the operational details and the technology used to acquire them because, because it's classified. But it doesn't sound like it actually would change the conclusion if you could see that. Uh, Josh has a comment. Carl Sagan had, a very, had very good chapters discussing UFO sightings in the book, The Demon Haunted World. Uh, yeah, great book. But also, you know what, if you go back, uh, Sagan was also part of a book, contributed to a book in, I believe, the 70s. I could be wrong. I haven't thought about it in a while, um, called UFOs, the Scientific Debate, where a lot of professionals, it was kind of like the first group of professional scientists to get together and in public, at least, discuss the topic. And, you know, that's, again, I haven't read it since probably like 1996, (laughs) but uh, I would guess there's still probably a lot of good material in there if you can hunt it down. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about ufology is that it has a, a long history that uh, a repetitive people sometimes history. very, very repetitive. And if anybody really wants to get into it, you've really got to look at the history. Like I, I got criticized a lot um, in my early debunking days for just looking at whatever the latest video was and debunking that or investigating it and figuring out some possible explanation. And they said, well, you don't know the full history of UFOs, Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, blah, 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 all this stuff. Uh, And you should really read these books. And they'll give me a long list of books to read. And I have, you know, to some degree started looking into this, this older stuff. And what really strikes you, as you know, is that it's exactly the same then as it is now. They talk about the exact same oh. things. How the, the government's covering up UFOs and that uh, maybe it's secret government technology and, uh, um, you know, the government does an investigation, but it's really a cover up. Uh, they, they investigate it and they say they need more data and there's no, no, nothing was solved. There's eyewitnesses, but are they, are they accurate? There's policemen chasing Venus along a country road. Exactly the same thing in 1948. It w- was it, it, like a year after. Uh, it started, you know, the year of Roswell. It's the, the exact same thing was going on back then. And yeah. it's just, it's very interesting to read these old accounts of things like government investigations into UFOs, the exact same type of thing, the exact same cases come up over and over again. I mean, does that mean that UFOs have been doing the same thing for all this time? I mean, that's one interpretation, but really, why haven't we figured it out? If UFOs have been buzzing us, for 70 years, why has nothing been done? The only real explanation is that there's a massive government cover-up. <laughs> so you've either got to go for massive government cover-up or we don't really have any good evidence. And I kind of lean towards the latter. 
Uh, another technical question from Nirev. Uh, when there are infrared videos, is there also a corresponding radar or other sensor data that show the same event? Well, theoretically, yes. Um, the infrared video that you see here, they can also take visible light video. But when they're doing that on the targeting pod, they, they do one or the other. So you're generally just seeing that video. There's also the radar that's going on at the same time. So there will be a record of the radar tapes. And that's both the radar from the plane itself. It has a little radar mounted in its nose. Uh, and it's radar from the ships around because they're part of the fleet and the fleet uh, synthesizes the data from all these multiple sources into one big picture, which appears in the plane as what they call the, the situational awareness page, which is like this God eye view of, of everything. And you see similar pages in the, in the ship as well. And this is all recorded. So in theory, there should be radar data of these infrared encounters and people have talked about it and they've talked about, they saw it and it shows a certain thing, but we don't have access to that. So in a way, that's kind of like an eyewitness account when you know, a pilot says, oh, I, I saw the data like the next day and it showed, showed this. Uh, that sounds good. It sounds like we have radar data, but we really don't have radar data. We have an eyewitness account of radar data. We do have the videos though. All right. Uh, Joel says we need studies of the believers. And I think that's a lot of, uh, I think uh, I think where a lot of people who are interested in UFOs, but not believers, I think that's probably where a lot of us come down now. It's more of a, an interesting psychological social uh, project than anything else. Yeah, it is fascinating. And there are a bunch of books uh, that kind of touch on that. That, uh, that I think in some ways are the more interesting ufology books, books that talk about uh, the interactions between the believers. Um, I was trying to think, there's, there's, uh, there's a book, let's see, Intimate Alien by, what's oh. his name, Halprin, which is uh, a mixed bag of stuff, but it's, it's an interesting perspective. And he talks about how, soci uh, how archetypes uh, can affect what people believe and you know, how uh, uh, People are predisposed to uh, like view things in a certain way. I think I think it's Sarah Scholes. I can't remember her name now. Who, who wrote a book which was pretty interesting on on UFOs, uh, and they are already here. Is another book. I kind of that's the book that she wrote. But <laughs> uh, the, there are interesting books on UFOs, and I'm, I'm, I might write, might well might might write one myself because I'm very interested in the topic, and uh, it's there's a, a degree of overlap. Yeah, my Escaping the Rabbit Hole book is all about conspiracy theories. And as I just mentioned, if you believe all the UFO mythology, you essentially have to believe some kind of government conspiracy is going on. You can't really get away from the idea that there's, yeah, this is all just accidentally not being resolved. The same thing's been going on for 70 years. Uh, they've been hovering over nuclear bases. They've been buzzing pilots. And I don't think that's all government incompetence. So you really have to posit some kind of conspiracy theory. So there's a lot of overlap between UFO believers and conspiracy theories. And of course, within UFO believers themselves, there's at one end, there's just very rational people who are like, what is that strange light in the sky? And then at the other end, you've got, uh, there are interdimensional visitors from uh, the Palladian uh, galaxy who are trying to elevate humanity to the next level with crop circles. Yeah. Uh, so you've, you've got like a very wide range of different types of people and the interactions between them, you know, within that spectrum is very interesting because you get the, the more nuts and bolts UFO believers get a bit annoyed at the more esoteric believers because they, they think they've, they've been disrepute to the, the story. And then you get the people who are just hardcore conspiracy theorists who believe yeah. that there's a big government co cover up, or perhaps there are aliens running the government, perhaps lizard people. So it's, it's a fascinating topic. But here's the thing. It's like, um, I think, I think you're right about uh, the conspiracy people. Cause like one of my premises going into that article was uh, disclosure. I, my thought was, is that, since there is such a paucity of good evidence, is disclosure all they have left is, is waiting for the government to reveal the secrets. But at the same time, people will tell me, other UFO, skeptical UFO researchers tell me that uh, it's trending much more into the mystical now, that it is becoming yes. 
more into say the Jacques Vallée's ultra terrestrials, basically magic beings. So if yeah. You're- believer you could just believe that they're all powerful so of course they could conceal themselves from us yeah and that's yes you know, obviously it comes up like why are photos of bigfoot so blurry it's because bigfoot has a a blurry field around him which makes photos blurry and the same thing with ufos like they there are technologies so advanced either they're deliberately cloaking themselves or it's a, a function of the warp drive that they use because it's warping space and time and so the light scatters around it and everything ends up looking like a blurry blob so it's a convenient excuse uh that you you can't see ufos because they're super advanced and um so but it's funny though i didn't i mean i didn't want to punish myself by watching lou elizondo in 60 minutes so i didn't but it's my understanding that he kind of even though he talks about it in other places he kind of eschewed all that uh mystical interdimensional stuff and was very nuts and bolts which yeah i, I think actually they cut well, it out well, I wonder if, was he just trying <laughs> I, was I, he just trying to sound serious uh i i think there's a degree of that but uh he he's mentioned it several times and he makes no secret of the the idea that he thinks that they might be interdimensional beings he's talked about that many times at least over the last year and uh he's got a standard little little riff he does they could be like extraterrestrials they could be ultra terrestrials and they could be interdimensional terrestrials and i could see actually at some point in the 60 minutes interview he was actually starting to say that and then they they cut it i think after extraterrestrials but he he definitely uh is is quite open-minded about the, the possibilities well that that just brings up another question i wonder if he actually did say it like a dummy and they cut it out because 60 minutes yeah seems to <laughs> that's what i think happened <laughs> uh laurie asks um are there private orgs doing good scientific research on uaps um say yeah, well uh, see something different Very yeah different. there's the seti which has been around for a while which is basically listening for um uh, uh extraterrestrial radio signals from from other uh, solar systems and they haven't found anything yet uh, there's a new organization called the Galileo Project, which is headed by Arvi Loeb, who uh, wrote a book called Extraterrestrials, which is about the possibility that the uh, uh, interstellar object that recently flew through our solar system called Oumuamua uh, was possibly some kind of alien artifact. And he's, he's a very strong believer that it's, it's, that's a very likely explanation. But he's also a, a good hardcore scientist who did a lot of research on black holes and uh, early star formation and stuff like that. So he knows his stuff. He's a smart guy. And he's actually started an organization, the Galileo Project, and their plan is to do a bunch of things. One is look for more Oumuamua type things and send a probe to them. But the main focus really is on setting up a network of telescopes to try to get high resolution photographs of UFOs, which would be great. You know, that's one of the things I mentioned earlier as uh, you know, that would be the ideal kind of gold standard of, of one set of evidence is to get high resolution photographs and he's already raised like nearly two million dollars from uh private donors possibly chris mellon seeing as he's got a lot of money but uh uh he he's he seems set on doing this thing i'm not sure how practical his proposal is because there's a lot of issues to do with uh, scanning the skies, looking for UFOs, and then taking photographs of them with telescopes. I mean, have you ever seen a good photograph of a bird taken with an astronomical telescope? It's quite hard to get things in shot. Uh, so there's going to be significant technical challenges. And uh, I think a better approach there would be to perhaps do scanning the skies for objects that where you could triangulate them and, and get the, the motion track. But if you've got enough money, doing both would be great too. Uh, and th- there are other organizations. There's uh, Sky Hub is kind of an open source organization trying to do a similar thing. They're trying to design a, a kind of general purpose camera system that you can just put it on your roof and it will search for UFOs and contribute to a network. Uh, and I, you know, I believe there's, there's, there's probably other organizations doing the same thing. And you could say that the UFO reporting organizations are... Uh, along those lines you know MUFON is an interesting thing and I think probably other ones like like New Fork the National UFO Reporting Center 
they they do a lot you know people in, who are in them often have a good idea about what it takes to get ufo reports but i think they're all crippled by getting an avalanche of data they've got so many reports you, they just can't go through them all they can't investigate them and so they just end up being dumped in this database and their their guidelines end up just being slightly better reporting practices but you still get a load of crap and it would be good to perhaps you know go through that that data uh, in a in a better way but you know that's something they mentioned in the UAP report we need better data sets better quality data sets with consistent reporting and baselines and that's something we don't have yet but you know that's something that private organizations could work towards yeah yeah, you're right about MUFON being interesting because I was a, I, I subscribed to the journal in the 90s and it just got too in the weeds for me at some point. And I was yeah. like, you, it, was, it became a point where you're not trying to figure out what's true. You're trying to argue a certain thing. And um, it's my, I mean, I, I, you know, you can't know, they have tons and tons of field investigators and you can't really know what, the agenda or lack of agenda of any of those. Yeah. But it seems like the leadership is always trying to push a specific narrative. Yes. Uh, I think that's just probably down to the, the individuals. Yeah. People get into UFOs uh, because they think they are amazing things that are probably aliens. And that's the main reason people who are interested in UFOs get into it is that they have a strong belief that there's something amazing going on there. So most of the people who are looking at UFOs have this somewhat of a cognitive bias, you know, cognitive dissonance that kind of guides them towards uh, the more esoteric explanations. There's an organization called SCU, the Scientific Coalition for Ufology, I believe. And they do a bunch of analysis of, of, of cases, like the cases that I, I discussed, and they come to different conclusions. And part of it, I think, is that they kind of, they make assumptions that, that favor the outcome that they desire. And they will probably deny that to, to the end of the earth. But, you know, that essentially seems to be what is happening to me yeah. is that they're, they're not, they, they end up pivoting on a point like in the, the FLIR video, does it lose lock? You know, does the camera lose lock or does the object move off the side? And they say, oh, well, you know, we asked this pilot and he says this system never loses lock. So we'll go with that. When <laughs> you can actually see by looking at the video that it is losing lock. And you ask other people, you ask multiple people, you know, it, it does lose lock. So they, they, they gravitate towards a certain explanation. That's probably, you know, I probably do too as well, to be fair. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably a little bit biased because I've investigated so many UFO videos and they all turn out to be crap. <laughs> I, I perhaps that has become my default expectation. So, uh, you know, you have to really check yourself as much as possible. Right. But you know, it does seem to be a bit of a trend. Like we said, the, uh, the general public might not necessarily have a default expectation. And it's interesting that SETI got brought up earlier because the question, well, here, here's what happens to, when I hear, when I overhear somebody talking about UFOs recently because of the reports and everything. They'll say like, yeah, it could be real. I mean, there's got to be alien life out there. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Two very different questions, whether there's alien life, whether it yeah. can get here or not, which is really the difficult part. So uh, pursuant to that, Nirev has a great question, um, which might be the most important one of all. How do you recommend discussing these reports with people who want to believe but aren't true believers? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, my advice when or just discussing any who's kind, of, kind of like on the yeah. fence or in the middle, uh, I think essentially just talk about it in a kind of Socratic conversational way. Ask them what they know already about UFOs, and try to build on that. Because you could start trying to tell them stuff about the UFO topic, and if you don't actually understand where they're coming from. And you could be just, you know, talking across purposes. So start out just basically getting them to tell you uh, what, what they think. And then you can give them information that's more specific and more tailored to their beliefs. But don't leap in and start, you know, mocking them and telling them it's all nonsense. Just let you have a conversation with them uh, in a, you know, kind of fairly neutral way because you, know, you have a lot of facts, I'm sure. 
and you can you can help them supply those facts to them but do it all based on shared understanding and start out just by talking to them and asking them what their beliefs are and work from there yeah i uh i um I recently started, uh, you know, rationally speaking with Julia Gale's podcast used to be associated with New York City Skeptics. I recently started going into the backlog and then listening to all of it. And um, something that they bring up time and again is um, is to be charitable to the other person's position. Like, just assume, don't assume yeah. that they're, you know, wackos or just trying to prove a certain thing. You know, go into it saying that they go into it thinking that yes, they are genuinely inquisitive and open to 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 other uh, to other um, ideas. Maybe they'll prove you wrong, but it's probably a good place. Yeah, to no, maybe they will. But <laughs> you, know, you can start out by <laughs> respecting the other person because if yes. if, you, if it's clear from the outset that you don't respect them, then they're not going to re- listen to you. If you say our oh, UFOs are a bunch of nonsense, uh, then where do you go from there? They're not going to be like, oh, that's interesting. Why do you think that? Uh, they're going to they're <laughs> going to be they're going to be hurt yeah. because you've just called you know an interest of theirs. There's nonsense, yeah. and uh, they will start challenging you, and they'll be much less receptive. So you start out yeah. listening to them, and if they see you listening to them, then uh, they will listen to you. Yeah, I like to. I I always say, um, you know, as soon as you start from that position, like the wall goes up, and you're not getting through. It's just yep. Well, um, I guess, Mick, if you want to hang out for another 10 minutes, uh, we said three to five, um, uh, be, get a little dangerous here. We'll say if anybody wants to unmute themselves Uh-oh. and, uh, you know, ask a question to hang out. Uh, Mick, yeah, I'm happy for another 10 minutes. I'm good. <laughs> Does anybody have any, anybody, what's going on with everybody today? Anyone? I will boot you if I think you're an ass. That's up to the discretion. Eating the heat today. That's good Thank questions. You. Thank you. You always have good questions. What other uh, types of things do you debunk? All of them. <laughs> uh, like, like I said, I started out doing chemtrails. Uh, I but actually I started before that with a thing called uh, Morgellons, also oh, pronounced wow. Morgellons, depending on who you talk to. And I have a website called Mor- MorgellonsWatch.com, which is a, very old now. I think it's not been updated for uh, like 10 years or so. Uh, but it was quite popular back when Morgellons was popular. And it's not really a thing that you can debunk, but what it is is the belief that people uh, think that their symptoms are caused by uh, basically fibers growing out of their skin, which are caused by some kind of infestation. But when you investigate it, it it turns out that these are more likely just clothing fibers caught on their skin. And I I wrote a whole bunch about it. And that was kind of my start on uh, doing blogging and investigating and uh, kind of explaining things. Then moved on to chemtrails. Also do a lot of 9-11 debunking. That again is the topic that has kind of died away uh, quite a lot in recent years. And I've I've already addressed most of the points that get raised. So it's the same thing over and over again. I do flat earth, which is which is a fun thing because it's uh, gets allows you to flex your geometry muscle. Uh, and I just do a bunch of other random things like you know, false flag accusations when people say a, a school shooting has been hoaxed and things like that. Uh, look into that and show that it hasn't generally, well, always. And anything anything else that people throw at me. The, the book the, really covers those, like the four main things would be like chemtrails, 9-11, flat earth, and false flags. But I'm, I'm certainly open to other things. Now, now UFOs are one of the things I've been spending a lot of time on. You, you've inherited it. Uh... <laughs> One of, the, one of the things I talked about, and again, my article years ago, was that um, the turnover in UFO investigators, because again, it has been 70 years, and uh, it seems like, well, you know, some of the old, uh, well, we've already lost a lot of the old uh, skeptical people, with Phil Klatt and uh, yeah. Carl Sagan, obviously. Uh, Robert Schaefer's still hanging on for now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's not a lot of people out there. Yeah, and... Uh, it's interesting looking back on those those people uh, as well. Like a lot of the stuff that they did 
was you know, essentially the type of stuff I'm doing now. Uh, Hynek, who became a UFO believer, did a whole bunch of reasonable debunking. Did some bad debunking as well, uh, yeah. but you know, he 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 did good investigations. And a lot of people, even even believers, do good investigations because if you're really into it, the, the subject, you you want to investigate it to remove the stuff that isn't true. Uh, or that could be easily explained by something else. So a lot of the people who do UFO investigations are UFO believers themselves. This is interesting. Somebody, somebody asked in the chat, Josh, do or do or did you have any affiliation with the James Randi Educational Foundation? I don't believe that's operational anymore, but I don't know if you did in the past. No, I, I, I didn't really have any affiliation with them. I, I've been to a few um, uh, amazing meetings and I met James Randi a couple of times. I had a chat with him once where I asked him, should I use the term debunker or not? And he told me not to, but I kept using it anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he may have been right. <laughs> uh, but no, I have no actual affiliation uh, with them. I wanted or to with say, the, uh, the forum. No, I, don't, I have a yeah, question. Like I, I, I'm sorry. Marcus, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question if I may. Um, it seems that uh, hardcore believers in... Uh, in the existence of physical beings like aliens and Bigfoot, um, when they're confronted with, with you know, just the lack of evidence, they seem to retreat into um, spiritualism and uh, you know another phenomena that are not physical, you know, like the psychic Bigfoot and all of that. Do you find that in any other area? Hmm. Not really. No. I think like those people that you're talking about were probably people who are very much into psychic phenomena in any way. And a lot of the theories that I talk about are pretty technical, like right. the 9-11 stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm countering the architects and engineers for 9-11 truth, and they're coming out with all these finite element modeling type stuff, which is all quite complicated. And yeah, I don't think you necessarily have the spiritual type people interested in that. So maybe the people you've been talking to kind of exist at the intersection between uh, those two realms anyway. Uh, I don't think people are going to just jump from uh, a nuts and bolts type investigator of UFOs over to the spiritual, but there certainly is that overlap within, within the, the topic. Yeah. So I guess it may be that I have it the other way. Someone who's more likely to believe in something spiritual and beliefs in Bigfoot applies it to that, and you know, and the aliens and so. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's actually yeah, def that's that definitely would would I think yeah. make more sense I think than someone becoming more spiritual if that's they can't find an explanation. It's, they have, they, it's a, like Marcus, if I'm understanding, it sounds like maybe they have a particular worldview already, and then this new phenomenon appears on their radar, and they just kind of apply their worldview to that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes the most sense, actually. Yeah. Interesting. And it's so funny, the history, Joel, we'll come to you in one sec. Okay. Uh, the, it, the history thing where, like, you started with the contactees in the 50s, where it was very spiritual and space brothers, and they're here to save us from Venus and all that sort of thing. And then, boom, right? In, they, I was like, no, let's forget about that. No, now we're nuts and bolts. <laughs> Oh, it's kind yeah, of yeah. Just a quick comment on that. I was I was yeah. reading a book, one of the uh, books about UFO history. I can't remember which one it was. Probably on my Kindle somewhere. But they actually said that the the spiritualism stuff kind of started a bit later. Like it was really? a more of a a seventies type really? thing. You know, the age of age of Aquarius, where it really took off with with abductees. Yeah, sure. Uh, and actually, no, it might have been in JJ Abrams' uh, docu documentary. I think maybe episode four. Yeah, episode four of JJ Abrams' documentary talks about this. How the early UFO stuff was more about uh, seeing things in space, and then it kind of became uh, more about people being abducted in, I believe, the seventies. And the guy talking about it was theorizing this might have been because there was this this big fear at the time about home invasions that was being popularized in the media. So it was a thing that was very much on people's subconscious minds that someone was going to come into their home and tie them up. And this kind of got conflated in their dreams with, uh, with UFOs. Well, that's an interesting theory, but I'm not sure really yeah. you know, how factual it is. Joel, you had something to say? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't disagree with you, uh, uh, Mick, uh, about, uh, you know, whether there are, you know, whether there's any evidence for uh, UFOs or, 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 or any of that spiritual stuff. Uh, but what's, uh, because I don't think you can change any, but I don't think you can change anyone's mind either. And I think you've said that uh, yourself in, in various ways. So what is the goal? Well, I don't think that's true though, because people, people do end up changing their minds. I mean, Russ himself was a, a, a I guess, a, a UFO enthusiast to a degree and then became less of a UFO enthusiast with time. People change over time. And you can help improve the situation by helping people change quicker or stopping people falling into uh, this, this type of belief, belief system in the start. There are well, always going to be a, some people that you can't change. Yes, exactly. And just to quibble with, not to quibble, but to uh, expand on this a little bit. So I lived in a small town. And I actually didn't know anybody else who was into UFOs. Everybody thought it was kind of silly. So in a sense, socially, it was almost in my best self-interest to get out of that. But at the same yeah. time, once I got into science, that wasn't cool either. So it was really a wash at that point. But as you've told me, and I put in your the uh, interview I did with you about the uh, Department of Truth comic, that's in the chat now. I asked you to do that because you have such a breadth of, you do cover so many different conspiracies and stuff. Um, but as you say, a lot of conspiracies, it becomes part of who they are. Uh, it becomes maybe not so much in UFOs. Tell me what you think about that. But like certainly things like QAnon, it's part of people's social structure. I, I think it, it does with UFOs. Uh, like when I post things on Twitter now, uh, if I post a little funny picture of a bird or something, people like assume that I'm talking about UFOs. And it's almost like they can't conceive of me having a life outside of UFOs because I'm a you know, big UFO guy. And, and I think for a lot of them, their whole lives becomes UFOs. You look at these, a lot of these people, you look at their Twitter feed or you look at their Facebook feed. You know, Normal people's Facebook feeds, it's like family and friends and fun. A UFO person's Facebook feed is everything that's going on in the UFO universe right now. So it does become very much a part of who they are and their, their whole social scene and even their essentially their reason for existence. You know, what they're doing with their lives is getting UFO disclosure out there and doing research into UFOs. And you get the same thing with conspiracy theorists. It does become the number one thing in their life. If you have ever seen, uh, uh, what is it? Um, Behind the Curve, the Flat Earth documentary on Netflix, it really becomes, I mean, those people, the, the believers, they become each other's families. So yeah. uh, I think it becomes a lot harder to, and I think you said this before too, a hot, lot harder to help them at that point. But you think, I just put a review for your book, Escaping the Rabbit Hole in the, in the chat, but you think even those people you can, you can reach. Well, people change. Uh, someone might be unreachable at a certain point in their life but they also might be on essentially a trajectory where they are learning new things and they will become a different person when they've kind of crossed a certain critical mass of new information. So no, no one is without hope, even though they seem within the moment that they are. A lot of people you, you hear like, you know, my, my dad's secure and believer now and I've lost him forever. And that's not true. Like your dad is going to change and he may change back. He may, he may get worse, but you know, he, he will change because people change because they get exposed to new things. And someone in five years' time is not going to be the same person that they are now, even, even in a year's time. So I, I say there's always hope for people, no matter how stuck they seem to be in their belief systems. Well, that's good. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad to end on a little optimism here. Um, and yeah, I do highly recommend uh, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, of course. Um, I haven't got a chance to read it myself but my reviewer just glowed about it and she and said there is a lot of that um optimistic talk in there about um maybe just maybe and i think i think one of the points that she made was that you say like you know you're not going to change somebody overnight and, you know just be a presence yeah. Alive yeah. and kind of you know just talk to them every once in a while and but yeah, keep them in touch with reality uh and that's the thing like you it's a it's a big mistake to think because you can't change someone today, it doesn't mean you can never change them. If you can't change someone in a month, it doesn't mean you can never change them. 
you got to, you know, keep, keep, keep holding out hope because people do change. Even the worst, the, the people I, I list, I uh, interviewed in my book, some of them were people who were hardcore believers for a decade or more. And eventually something happened and they saw something that made them start to question and then things unraveled. You know, after a decade of being deep into these, these strong beliefs, like 9-11 conspiracy theories and ancient alien conspiracy theories, that type of thing, and they came out. So people do get out. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mick. This was tremendous. Uh, really can't thank you enough for your in-depth analysis here and hanging out and chatting with us. Oh, it's been fun. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we'll get this up on YouTube Hello. shortly. Um, thanks again. Uh, if you want, again, at the top of the chat, you can donate to the New York City Skeptics. Check out AIPT Science, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Bye, everyone.